Welcome to the Red Light Report, your number one source for all things red light therapy, where you will learn how to optimize your health, wellness, and longevity with the power of photobiomodulation. I'm your host, Dr. Mike Belkowski. All right, guys, welcome back to yet another episode of the Red Light Report. On today's call, we're, we're traveling across the Atlantic Ocean once again to Estonia, where we have Seem Land, who is an author speaker, and consultant from Estonia. He talks about biohacking, performance, and health optimization. And he is an absolute powerhouse when it comes to uh, producing educational content for all things health, wellness, and longevity, from extremely in-depth books to blogs to courses and uh, to his social media and much, much more. His most recent book he put out called Stronger by Stress it's a manual, but it's quite a thick manual <laughs> that talks about uh, stress adaptation and hormesis and more, which we'll we'll get into here shortly. But without further ado, Seem, welcome to the Red Light Report, man. Yeah, thanks for reminding me and uh, glad to be here. Yeah, my pleasure. So before we jump into um, your knowledge and expertise on stress, give us a background of how you got into this whole realm of health, wellness, biohacking, longevity, uh, kind of your path to where uh, to what led you to where you are today? Well, uh, I've always been somewhat curious about the human body and uh, the human mind and everything related to our species. During my high school, I got more into like fitness and uh, bodybuilding and strength sports and that kind of thing. Working out at that time, I was doing just you know paying attention to nutrition, training. Uh, I did do some form of like intermittent fasting and uh, that kind of thing uh, in high school as well. After high school, I went into the Estonian military uh, for a little bit, and uh, there I more got interested in uh, the ability of humans to like endure different kinds of stressors and uh, environmental challenges like the cold the heat uh, starvation um, and as well as like you know psychological stress and those kind of things so uh, that was more like yeah another like motivation for me to uh, get involved in uh, something like that to just you know improve my own uh, performance and functioning and uh, longevity in the process i did study uh, anthropology in uh, the university and uh, that was also like very uh, linked to uh, all these uh, same topics. During the university, I did start to write my own blog uh, where I just shared some of my own uh, experiments. And uh, those turned into some books, uh, started a YouTube channel. And uh, now I've been doing yeah that since that time all, all, all the time, so to say. Like I have, yeah, have a YouTube channel, podcast, uh, Instagram. I have books and uh, do speaking and yeah, just um, <laughs> talk about everything I wrote to biohacking. Yeah. And when people hear that you've written books, I think they need to know that your books are like five, six, 700 pages. They're massive and they're just full of information, which is impressive to me because it takes a lot for me to write, uh, sit down and start writing something. Whereas for you, it seems like it's absolutely natural. I mean, you're putting out these, again, these massive books full of information. So I'm just kind of curious, what's your process for doing that? for sitting down and putting together all of this information, synthesizing it and putting into the information for the masses. Mm -hmm. I, I wasn't like a writer when I was, you know, in high school or something. Uh, that was just something that I uh, developed in, uh, in the university. So uh, then uh, I was just, you know, forced to uh, write more in anthropology. You most, there's no, like a lot of ex exams. Uh, there's most of the like essays. So uh, that's where I kind of got the kind of bug of uh, writing uh, and uh, doing research and uh, I kind of maybe enjoyed it. I also did, you know, think about, okay, what do I want to do in the future? For some reason, I just, you know, stumbled upon the idea of, yeah, writing. That's kind of something that I would think would be cool <laughs> to do, like to be a writer. That's what I decided to do in essence, decided to be like one of the main mediums that I uh, kind of use. From there, I just, you know, started to refine the skill. Because, yeah, initially, it's going to be difficult to sit down and get the words out. Most people struggle with that. Like the blank page is a killer for most people. But it's uh, like a learnable skill that uh, the more often you do it, then the easier it gets. I did start, start to write in like many forms. I, I did some journaling. I did uh, just some other like writing exercises. And of course, in the university, I was forced to write essays and stuff like that all the time as well. So I think that was just, you know, the neuroplasticity that changes your brain uh, to uh, work in some ways. And I uh, just got good at it. So to say, like, I um, got good at it fast. And uh, the reason was that, yeah, like many hours of uh, writing blog posts, many hours of uh, doing research, many hours of writing essays, 
and eventually just using those same uh, skills to start uh, writing books about as well. I may also have like a good ability to, um, you know, sit down and uh, get into a focused state. I don't get get distracted that, that easily. I am very able to focus on uh, this one thing for a long time. I also get into the flow of things uh, very easily. Like I can uh, put myself into this flow state uh, where I am just uh, immersed with the thing that I'm doing. Like I also like a uh, draw since a kid. Uh, I've been into drawing, and uh, yeah, that's a kind of similar idea that you're doing this something uh, creative thing and you're um, immersing yourself into this activity so much that you uh, lose your sense of time and it uh, becomes a very like enjoyable or intrinsically uh, motivating uh, to do it. That makes a lot of sense. So it's, it's quite a process, but you've turned it into something where, like you said, it's become something very creative and you can get into this flow state, which for a lot of people, I mean, it's, it's quite difficult to accomplish that or there's a uh, very few things that people do on a daily basis or even a weekly basis where they're put into a flow state because a lot of people work and work's not necessarily something where they get into that flow state. So it's something where it's creative or for some people it's sports or reading or just going on walks where they can actually get into that flow state. But for you, what are some things that you do that helps you put yourself into that flow state in a relatively succinct time? Well, um, I don't have like a ritual or something like that. <laughs> some people yeah, need to be in a specific location and uh, drink coffee and do some maybe breathing exercise or something like that, or say uh, affirmations uh, <laughs> to put the, the flow. Uh, but for me, I don't have like any uh, special tricks for, for the flow. I just start doing it. There's no like uh, real resistance when I am starting it. Like the biggest thing is that, yeah, the uh, initial first like two, three minutes, five minutes is the most hardest uh, part uh, for uh, the writing process or anything, uh, anything requires attention. But if you get over that, uh, then it uh, starts to flow and it becomes much more easy. But for me, like there is no resistance. Like I, I can start from like zero and there is no hesitation or something like that. I think it's just the yeah, result of having done it uh, for so long and so many hours. I just need to you know, be there and uh, start uh, doing it. And the kind of the flow state itself will uh, come uh, out of that. Well, that's pretty fortunate that you don't have much resistance because I think for a lot of people, <laughs> it's quite the opposite. So maybe the better question is, is there anything that disallows you from going into a flow state? Because it seems like it's easy more often than not, but is there anything that really disallows you from getting into that flow state so easily? Sometimes it could be that if the topic isn't like that enjoyable, then uh, yeah, it can be a bit longer or that I will, yeah, like just, you know, grind through it. But if it's something that I actually enjoy and want to learn about, then there's no like real uh, problems. Usually maybe it may be that, yeah, it's usually some sort of the topic itself, like a drudgery kind of a thing. Then it may be uh, problematic, but uh, generally, no. Gotcha. That makes sense. All right, Seem, let's let's jump into the topic of stress because you have a lot of great information on this, especially your the newest book you put out, again, Stronger by Stress. So let's talk about you know good stress versus bad stress and the various types of uh, stress responses to those. Well, stress itself is something that people associate negatively with, uh, but uh, from an like, evolutionary perspective and uh, just, you know, uh, scientifically, it can also be something that has positive uh, benefits. Stress is, it has like this uh, U-shape or a bell curve type of thing that uh, not enough stress can be bad uh, by keeping your body like uh, fragile, but excess stress for sure can also lead to burnout. So the good benefit is somewhere in the middle. This is called hormesis or um, dose-specific response to some sort of a toxin or stressor that actually makes the body stronger and more resilient. There are different kinds of uh, stress responses. Generally, like the over overarching uh, stress response is uh, still the same. Like physiologically, all these different stressors, both psychological and physiological, have a very similar effect on the body. Let's say imagining some sort of threat in your head or uh, watching a scary movie, it raises the same stress hormones as actually running away from uh, like a lion or something uh, because your brain doesn't really tell the difference between like what's outside and uh, what's like inside what you're imagining. So you can really literally create, you can literally be more stressed out because of your own like rumination and anxiety and uh, those kind of things uh, compared to actual physical danger. That's just one thing to know that the physiological response is still the same. There are some differences that some stressors uh, also uh, elevate certain different uh, biomarkers and they have like certain different effects. Uh, but the overarching uh, idea is that, yeah, like stress itself is the uh, same and it also has this uh, dose specific uh, response. The different types of stress response depend on the stressor. So, um, 
the stressor can be, like I said, psychological and it can be physical. The physical stressors usually involve like either like exercise, uh, nutritional related things, uh, energy depletion, heat, cold, hypoxia or uh, low oxygen, as well as all these uh, different kinds of environmental toxins, the chemicals, uh, heavy metals, pollution, pesticides, um, radiation, UV radiation from the sun, uh, those kind of things. Some of them have this hormesis, hormetic uh, bell curve, whereas others don't, like, you know, all maybe carcinogens and uh, chemicals and uh, these unnatural stressors tend to not have any benefit at all. So those are the only bad stuff. <laughs> but whereas uh, more the natural stressors that we would have experienced evolutionarily, exercise, uh, heat, cold, uh, fasting, uh, some uh, foods, our body has, you know, co-evolved with uh, those kinds of stress stressors for so long that we have developed these defense mechanisms and uh, other pathways uh, to deal with them. When we are exercising, we are experiencing the stress, but at the same way, you also uh, turn on these all other like longevity pathways and uh, improve like insulin sensitivity as well as help with fat loss, like, just a general like uh, health benefits we get from that because the body kind of detects, okay, we need to be stronger against uh, this kind of physical stress. Like we have to either run or we have to lift certain amounts of weights and whatnot. And the same applies to the cold and the heat as well. If we detect the signal from our environment that we experience cold every, every once in a while, then the body will, okay, we need to bolster our immune system so that we would be able to deal with it better. And the cold also has like some similar benefits of uh, longevity to that. It activates similar longevity pathways, as well as helps with the fat burning and uh, other kinds of the similar effects. So in essence, it's, it's the concept of what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. But at the same time, more is not better. Like you said, it's, it's that bell curve where on the left side, the stress isn't enough to elicit these pathways or these responses. And on the, on the right side of the curve, the stress is too much where you're actually causing damage and a detriment to your, to your body and to your physiology. Correct. Yeah, exactly. Like not enough stress can also be as bad as excess stress. If you don't exercise at all, you're sedentary, then your risk of all these chronic diseases goes through the roof. Like your risk of diabetes, obesity, neurodegeneration, uh, frailty, uh, metabolic syndrome, all those things uh, go super high because you don't experience this small amount of positive stress that would uh, kickstart the body to uh, ramp up these pathways and uh, stay healthy. And the same can apply to um, heat or the cold, that if you are always in this uh, equilibrium, in this balance uh, temperature, uh, or the same temperature all the time, then you don't, and you don't experience any variations in that, you're just leaving yourself very uh, vulnerable to the outside world. Because yeah, in the human society, we could <laughs> theoretically be in this uh, constant, uh, stable temperature all the time. But in the natural world, in the real world, there's always fluctuations, and those fluctuations keep the body more resilient. You're able to tolerate all the entire spectrum, so to say. You're able to tolerate the heat and the cold. Whereas if you don't experience them at, at all, even artificially, you're kind of leaving yourself again, uh, slightly uh, vulnerable and weaker. It's kind of similar to, like you're saying, with the temperatures where we're always in this very small range of temperature to be comfortable. In the same thought frame, we like to have a very sterile environment, a very clean environment. But when you go outside, and like you said, in the real world, that's just not how it is. So if you're if you're not constantly surrounding yourself by different, you know, bacteria and, and outside quote unquote dirty uh, ness, mm -hmm. your immune system's not built up. You're not going to be as resilient. So when you are exposed to some sort of, you know, outside pathogen, you're going to be less resilient. Like you said, you're going to be more fragile. So the whole point of hormesis or exposing yourself to a hormetic stress on a consistent basis is essentially just to make your, your body and your physiology more bulletproof and more resilient to, to the outside world. Correct. Yeah, well, yeah, the uh, bacteria for sure have also this uh, similar effect by uh, strengthening our immune system and uh, making itself more resilient. And uh, yeah, people who are, let's say, born with a C-section, the risk of actually a diabetes and obesity is uh, slightly higher because they don't have like this uh, bacteria that would uh, have this positive effect on their immune system. And uh, yeah, being in this constantly clean environment, constantly scraping things off, etc., because there's a difference between this innate immune system and adaptive immune system. The innate immune system is the one that you're born with, and the adaptive one is the one that you build throughout your entire lifetime. And uh, things, yeah, like different kinds of exposures, exercise, cold, the sauna, and these uh, pathogens and bacteria, natural bacteria in the dirt, those uh, increase your uh, this adaptive immune system strength and resilience. Of course, yeah, like if you get exposed to like 
pathological uh, and pathogens, uh, viruses, uh, those kind of things, then they will, could also have like, a yeah, negative effect on your immune system and uh, make you weaker, getting your hands dirty, those kind of things is uh, still beneficial. Definitely. So, so yeah, that's a good overarching uh, review of, of hormesis and the hormetic response. So let's get into a, a little more specifics, such as the concepts of mitohormesis and xenohormesis. So what are those and why are they important? Yeah, well, mitohormesis describes mitochondrial hormesis and uh, mitochondria are the power plants of the cell and uh, they also experience stress all the time. So uh, the process of uh, generating energy itself uh, creates stress stress, and uh, creates this uh, reactive oxygen species and free radicals that uh, in excess are quite harmful, uh, that uh, they are associated with aging. One of the theories of aging is the mitochondrial theory of aging, that you get older because of this uh, accumulation of uh, free radical damage. Uh, But those uh, reactive oxygen species also are like signaling molecules that in small amounts in moderation have benefits, like uh, exercise increases these reactive oxygen species, and uh, those reactive oxygen species are the signaling molecules uh, for some of the adaptations that occur uh, from exercise, like uh, getting stronger and uh, building muscle, getting faster, those kind of things. And if you block, if you block those uh, reactive oxygen species, then you don't see those um, adaptations either. So yeah, you do need some sort of small stress to actually get stronger and uh, cause these adaptations. The principle of mitohormesis itself, things that cause this uh, beneficial response usually have to do with yeah, like energy production and mitohormesis would be yeah, exercise, fasting, uh, cold, uh, the sauna, maybe not, maybe not the sauna that much, but they're mostly like exercise and fasting because uh, they forced your uh, mitochondria to become more energy efficient in a sense that uh, to be able to produce energy more efficiently in the process, you know, uh, get stronger and uh, more resilient as well. So with mitohormesis, like you said, the mitochondrial theory of aging basically says the more reactive oxygen species, the more oxidation that happens, the more mitochondrial dysfunction is going to occur and thus your longevity is going to decrease. So with these stresses they can put upon the mitochondria, like you said, it can be cold thermogenesis, fasting. We know that red light therapy or light exposure causes a, a hormetic response that you're causing transient increases in ROS or the reactive oxygen species. Thus, it's not too much, it's not too little, but you're creating this response where your cells, your mitochondria have to become stronger, more resilient. So when they are exposed to the stresses again, they're more able to take them on and you're able to stress them at a higher level. Again, just causing that hormetic response. And it's just kind of just like lifting, you can lift more and more and more over time, but you don't want to do too much at once and cause damage or injury. So like you're saying, it's important not just to strengthen the body like mechanically with the muscles, but at a cellular level, you want to stress the mitochondria as well. So with that being said, what are some, you've already mentioned some of them, but what are other of the better hormetic responses that people can practice for, for stress resilience and longevity? Yeah, well, uh, I mentioned already exercise and fasting. Uh, both of them uh, have to be taken like in the right amounts, especially with like, fasting. Like you can't, you can't you know, fast for like uh, days and days. Eventually you have to eat but most people aren't able to like they're not willing to go that far anyway so some form of like uh, time restricted eating on a daily basis where you just skip a meal or skip some snacks and uh, confine your eating window a little bit that already provides uh, like a pretty good stimulus uh, for hormesis and also has like some other uh, health benefits uh, found in research like it uh, lowers uh, blood pressure lowers blood sugar uh, lowers insulin helps with some other longevity markers generally is uh, just better or not better, like let's say a good strategy for uh, overall longevity as well, besides just uh, stress uh, resilience. And with exercise, the like threshold for excess exercise is a, a much uh, higher than uh, with fasting. You can get away with a lot more exercise uh, than uh, you you usually think. <laughs> but uh, the problem with that can be that if you exercise for like too long, then you may see like this transient uh, drop in immune, immunity. So you uh, do get uh, slightly weaker in terms of your immune system if you over-exercise or uh, over-train. I think that is quite subje- subjective. Uh, some people uh, can easily uh, exercise for like hours and not uh, get any problems. Uh, whereas if people who are already have like slightly uh, immunocompromised for them, uh, then uh, they kind of need to first build up their uh, tolerance uh, to the exercise. One of the best uh, forms of uh, hormesis are uh, the sauna or let's say any other like hyperthermia, any other heat exposure and the cold. Uh, so the sauna 
you do experience uh, the hypothermia during exercise as well. And uh, the sauna has some similar benefits uh, to exercise, um, but, but it's uh, slightly more exacerbated. Like you get more of this uh, hypothermia when you're in the sauna. And uh, the most biggest benefits with the hypothermia is that uh, it has a pretty amazing effect on the immune system. And that there's a lot of research showing that um, regular sauna use reduces the risk of the common flu and the influenza and uh, other respiratory infections are quite a lot. And uh, it's almost like a linear uh, response that uh, the more the sauna you take, then the lower your risk of disease is. Ease. The same applies to heart disease. Like the more sauna you take, the lower your heart disease risk is because uh, what happens with the sauna is that you basically have this positive effect on the blood flow and uh, heart function. And you also release uh, nitric oxide that uh, also improves the endothelial function. So it has an amazing effect on the cardiovascular function and uh, the lungs, the respiration system. You also like excrete, you know, heavy metals and uh, toxins and uh, those, those kinds of things uh, as well through the sweat. So it's uh, just an amazing uh, tool. The cold also has uh, some immune system benefits, like uh, the cold increases glutathione. It uh, also turns on some other antioxidant defense systems. There's a higher risk of getting sick from the cold than it is with the sauna. Like you can easily get uh, sick if you go winter swimming or something like that, because uh, your body may not be able to tolerate that. Yeah, if it's like super cold, then eventually it's going to have like a negative effect. But then, you know, something like a cold shower, occasional ice ice bath, uh, cold plunge a little bit, uh, swimming even like during this autumn time, it does have like a pretty uh, good positive boost on the immune system. And besides that, you also activate this uh, brown adipose tissue, which is uh, the opposite of white adipose tissue. And the brown adipose, adipose tissue is more insulin sensitive. It's more uh, thermoregulative. It uh, is better for energy production, gen generally healthier than just this white fat that you can use only for uh, burning calories. And uh, the cold actually converts some of the white fat into brown fat. It's a great tool for um, you know, body composition as well. This podcast interview was brought to you by the Longev Revive Cream. If you haven't heard of this cream before, go back and listen to the podcast interview with David Horneck, one of the people that helped create this amazing cream. The cream is specifically developed to enhance red light therapy treatment sessions. And not only that, but improve vibrational healing from the frequencies of full spectrum sunlight. The Revive includes special ingredients such as photodynamic amino acids, which helps convert UV light to red light. It increases production of this thing called fibronectin, which is said to be the holy grail of anti-aging. And then there's astaxanthin, which has been shown in clinical studies to increase skin moisture, moisture retention, and elasticity. There's turmeric, which contains an antioxidant, anti-inflammatory, and antimicrobial properties. There's copper peptides, which also has antioxidant, anti-inflammatory effects. C60 has high antioxidant power to prevent skin aging, 172 times more than vitamin C. And then there's also geranium rose, shungite, humic acids. And most of these ingredients are organic and they're all high, high quality. So if you want to check this cream out, go to longev.com, that's L-O-N-G-E-V-V.com, or you can also find it on biolite.shop. That's biolite.shop. Yeah, and with the cold as well, with cold exposure, cold thermogenesis, whether it's in a bath, shower, or the river, it also amplifies, you know, mitochondrial production or my mitobiogenesis, where you're increasing mitochondrial density, which is extremely important. You want as much density as possible because that's going to allow for more efficient energy production and, and helps with longevity. So yeah, those those are some great ones as far as how to you know optimize some hormetic practices. So with that being said, how do you know out of out of the obvious, you know, feeling lethargic or just broken down? How do you know uh, when you're too stressed out and and when you need to kind of step back and uh, and recover versus pushing forward with um, let's say because it's easy to overexercise. You just want to keep improving and getting more and more fit. So again, when, when do you know that you've gone too far, it's too much, you need to rein it in and go into recovery mode versus let's say hormetic mode? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, the first thing uh, that usually goes down is the uh, heart rate variability. So HRV describes the interval between your heartbeats. So uh, the up and the bottom of the top of the heartbeat uh, describes the, the amount of uh, between that. So a healthy heart that is uh, less stressed out uh, or isn't stressed out has this high vari vari variability. So duh, like this peak swings, whereas 
the stressed out heart has more like monotonous and very like you know short intervals uh, between that and you can measure that uh, hrv with different devices i use like the aura ring that uh, tracks my sleep as well and based upon that number you can see like whether or not your body is uh, recovered or is it stressed out and under recovered if you see that your hrv starts to uh, plummet then uh, that can be like an indication that you either are you know under recovered or you you're like about to catch something so to say like you uh, may be catching a cold uh, because of your uh, you know recovery is uh, jeopardized and uh, you're kind of getting weaker uh, you can also look at that number to uh, yeah assess your uh, training like should you push yourself should you go hard or you should, should you take a, like a day off uh, take a rest day uh, which is uh, like a great uh, thing because like exercising on top of already uh, being under covered under recovered will be uh, let's say net negative because yeah you may get away with it once but you know if you keep pushing it and you're you're not really taking the time to recover then eventually it's gonna catch up on you so it's much better to kind of you know try to listen to your body and uh, look at the look at the feedback uh, that you're getting other other signs are more like a visible signs would be things like uh, confusion uh, memory loss and uh, not being able to think straight, not being able to concentrate, being very tired, chronically tired all the time, super sore, uh, dragging your feet, having no energy without caffeine, uh, sleeping problems. Yeah, th those kinds of things. Uh, ba balance issues, not being able to balance yourself. Um, those kinds of things uh, are all just an indication of uh, your nervous system being under recovered. Gotcha. So basically, you've overtaxed your nervous system to where you're chronically in the sympathetic state and you don't have a good balance with your parasympathetic, thus, like you said, with the heart rate variability, it's going to have a lower number. Your body's not able to tap into its parasympathetic as well. So your HRV is going to be wrecked. Your, your recovery is terrible. So pulling the reins back, doing some, some of these techniques, whether it's breathing or just recovery, whether it's with nutrition and otherwise like the sauna, restoring that balance with the parasympathetic state to where you're able to then go forward and, mm -hmm. and push yourself with these hormetic responses again. So let's get into longevity just quickly before we get into uh, a red light therapy. I'm kind of curious currently what your top strategies are for, for anti-aging and longevity. Right. Yeah. Well, I'm only 27. So uh, there's not a lot of like uh, crazy strategies that I do uh, to slow down aging uh, besides just like the fundamentals of uh, exercising regularly, doing some form of this uh, time machine, eating, uh, sleeping well, or this like trying to sleep well <laughs> and uh, eating a good diet and those kind of things. Uh, and the sauna and the cold, uh, all those things are in what I consider like longevity. Uh, I'll maybe say like what I think is important for longevity, so to say, or what I'm trying to like optimize at the moment. You know, what you see with uh, getting older is that uh, all these like anabolic hormones uh, go down, your muscle mass goes down, strength goes down, bone density goes down. The muscle mass is very linked to uh, just living longer. And the people who have slightly more muscle mass they are more resilient against, you know, uh, hip fractures and uh, falling down and those kind of things. So when you are, let's say in your 70s or 80s, then it's super important to have some sort of resistance training in your routine to uh, maintain the muscle mass. Like the importance of muscle mass and the resistance training becomes uh, increasingly more uh, important after 50s. So before 50s, you can like, get away with, yeah, like not training, but uh, after 50s, you probably should do some form of, form of uh, resistance training. But, you know, you start to see this decline in muscle mass already uh, in 30s and uh, 40s. So, uh, yeah, I think that the kind of the early, earliest you start and uh, the m more consistent you are with it, uh, then kind of the better it is. But, uh, yeah, like the, it's, it's more important in your 40s and 50s than it is in my 20s. Regardless, I still do it um, because it's also him it helps with uh, your metabolic health, like muscle mass and uh, strength or training um, improves your uh, metabolic uh, flexibility and increases your insulin sensitivity and uh, keeps your, let's say, biomarkers healthier. That is just, you know, one of the most direct ways you age. Like you have bad biomarkers, you have a high blood sugar and a high, uh, let's say, triglycerides, high insulin, you will see accelerated aging uh, because... Um, the body is under like this excess energy and uh, it's not functioning well. It's not able to store nutrients uh, that well. It becomes obese. It uh, you know raises uh, bad biomarkers in the body. The easiest way to keep your biomarkers in check is to exercise, eat well, not in excess. And yeah, those are the most important things. But you know, adding some intermittent fasting can also um, help to deal with that. I personally do think that intermittent fasting does have a benefit uh, on longevity, although it's not proven yet. Uh, the only thing that's proven to slow down aging is uh, calorie restriction. And uh, eating less calories, um, almost like linearly, 
increases the lifespan of the uh, said animal, that they, they eat 20 to 30 percent less calories and they live also 20 to 30 percent longer. Or it's uh, quite difficult in the free world. Most people aren't able to do that. And at least like the current theory is that some form of this intermittent fasting and time restricted eating uh, can mimic some of these uh, effects that you get from calorie restriction without necessarily having to like uh, fully restrict uh, those amount of calories. Although you can't probably like overeat calories and uh, get away with it. You still need to practice some calorie restriction, but uh, you don't need to fully be on this um, like this calorie restriction society where people are super frail and uh, super skinny because they eat on very little calories, hoping that it's going to extend their lifespan. So uh, I try to be mindful of my carb intake, of not being on a super high carb diet and not like, you know, spiking my blood sugar unnecessarily all the time. I do saunas regularly. I do cold. I do take like a few supplements that I do think that help with longevity, like some mitochondrial supplements like and heart supplements like CoQ10 and you know, magnesium, glycine, um, or organ meat capsules, uh, K2, uh, vitamin D, you know, protein powder if I'm drinking that uh, creatine. And yeah, just like a general uh, health snack. So for, for time restricted, like you're saying, if you eat the same amount of calories within the time restricted window that you would throughout the course of the entire day, you're not getting the same longevity benefits if you were literally restricting or reducing the amount of calories on a 24 hour basis. Is that correct? At least that's not proven in the research yet. Yeah. Well, it's not yet proven. There are like a few studies that uh, see that even uh, if the animals eat the same amount of calories, those those animals that eat it in a confined eating window do better than the ones uh, eating uh, throughout the you know, throughout the day all the time. How big of a difference it is, uh, we don't know that uh, yet, and maybe it doesn't apply to humans. But uh, yeah, that in theory, because when you're in a fasted state, then you're like you know you are calorie restricted in the fasted state. The longer you fast then the higher this uh, energy depletion increases. You know, if you've been fasting for three days, then uh, that's like, you know, three days of calorie restriction or like even more than three days of calorie restriction because you can only calorie restrict so much until it stops stops working. Your body gets used to it. And uh, yeah, you need to eat <laughs> at some point. Uh, so yeah, the I do think that it's important to be like in moderate with your calorie intake, but some sort of time restricted eating uh, can also have some uh, benefits on that. And yeah, you, you definitely, it doesn't definitely mean that you can, you know, overeat uh, calories and still ex- expect to get better. Sure. And you get these physiological benefits by not eating on top of, you know, reducing the window of when you eat those calories. Like you get, at some point you get the increased autophagy, you know, the cellular cleanup. And then later on you mm-hmm. get increasing growth hormone production. And then later on at 36 hours or so you get increase in stem cell production. So, so there's different physiological benefits that go along with the calorie restriction, which I think makes mm-hmm. the time restricted eating so beneficial let alone that you're you're not using this energy to digest the food. So now your body's using that energy to grow, repair, and take care of other things that it couldn't otherwise because when you're eating so often, it has to spend energy on digesting. So mm-hmm. I'm curious, what is your typical window of eating? Is it 10 hours, 8 hours, 6 hours? What do you typically try to do? Uh, well, I uh, typically do uh, one meal a day. So uh, I usually eat within a two hour window or something like that in the evenings. That's what I've been doing for like the f- f- last uh, five years. Uh, but it's not like a full on one meal a day because I do have like a protein shake uh, during my workout uh, at daytime. So um, one and a half meals, two meals, if, if you like to call that. Uh, the reason I do it is because of convenience. It's uh, simple and it's easy and it doesn't like uh, interfere with my uh, gym and uh, like uh, fitness and uh, muscle growth either. So I've been still able to build muscle with it. If I were to do only one meal a day without the protein shake, then I probably wouldn't be able to build muscle uh, because you do st- you still need to feed your body and uh, provide a protein to uh, stimulate muscle protein synthesis and uh, grow. Uh, and you can't really do that if you only eat once. You know, you you will spike the protein synthesis once, but it's you know it may not be enough. You need to kind of uh, have several spikes if you really want to build muscle. At the minimum, I think like the good golden balance is like a sixteen hour fast, eight eight hour eating window. Uh, but you can already get some benefits for like a 14 hour fast, 10 hour eating window, uh, 12, 12 is also like fine. Um, but you, if you go into the other direction that your eating window is larger than the fasting window, like you, uh, fast for only eight hours and you eat uh, within uh, 16 hours, which is the average American does, then uh, I think that's the kind of the uh, bad, bad uh, situation. So you want to be at least like a 50, 50 and a slightly leaning more 
it's also like a slightly longer uh, fasting window every day. Gotcha. That makes sense. So let's get into some red light therapy. I know that you, you said you use it on a daily basis. How long have you been using red light therapy? Uh, what have you noticed with it? Have you used it for any specific conditions or pain or athletic performance? Um, yeah. So tell us, tell us about your red light therapy experience. Yeah, well, I, I've been using that uh, red light therapy for three or four years, maybe three. The, the biggest thing that I've noticed, I don't know, like a more like a well-being sort of thing, like more psychological benefits. So to say, like I've, I've never had like any skin issues and uh, no joint pain and stuff like that either. So I can't really tell like whether or not it helps with those things uh, that much. My skin complexion is maybe like a bit better if I uh, use it more regularly. But yeah, like the, I think the almost like well-being benefits, psychological benefits, like you're very calm and relaxed in front of it. Uh, those are also like uh, great. I use it almost yeah every day, five to six uh, times a week is what I use it. The length is going to be somewhere 50 minutes is usually. Uh, but I may also have like uh, mini breaks where I do it for like one minute. You know, if I've been sitting, if there's like a cloudy sky or something and uh it's like 7 p.m. at night, then I'll do it for maybe like, you know, two minutes or something just to get the circadian rhythm benefits, uh, because that's also like another, this hidden benefit that you get from that. You usually get the red light mostly from the sunset and the evening. So using that in the evening can also be like a good uh, circadian signaling that you tell your body that it's uh, evening time and starts to prepare the, like for, for all these uh, other processes like melatonin production and uh, winding down and things, things like that. So uh, yeah, I use it quite for quite a, like a different uh, purposes. And that's a question I get a lot is timing. When should I use red light therapy? Should I use it first thing in the morning and last thing at night or or is there a specific time I need to be using it? And mm-hmm. what I tell people is that you need to find out whether or not red light therapy either stimulates you and or relaxes you because everyone gets uh has a different response. It's like an N equals one, you know, as is health and biohacking. So you kind of need to see how you respond. So it sounds like you uh, seem that you're more relaxed by the red light therapy. You're not not necessarily energized by it. Yeah. Like um, if I, what if I were to use it like uh, immediately before, before bed, then I may get a bit too much hyped up a little bit, uh, but yeah, I don't really get uh, too, too overstimulated. Uh, by that it's uh yeah kind of a warm and uh, <laughs> it relaxes me more than uh hypes me up when you're doing your uh, typical session you said you do about 15 minutes is it always red and near infrared or are you changing it up based on how you're feeling that day or if you're wanting to do let's say deeper tissues like the muscle and bones and joints and brain like do you vary it day to day or is it basically the same thing most days most days is yeah like at minimum 50 minutes or if i'm like in a hurry then of course i'll keep it shorter yeah usually it's just like uh, 50 minutes at minimum i may also do it like a bit longer if i'm doing like a front side first for 50 minutes and then the back side maybe like a bit less maybe 10 minutes or something depends on how much time i usually have i don't really go like longer than that but i may keep it shorter like i may keep it also on like just five minutes with the red and near infrared are you always using the combo of both or or just one or the other yeah, usually uh, both. Yeah. Okay. What are you doing during the red light therapy sessions? Are you just soaking in the rays and the photons, or are you, you know, stacking something with like breathing or meditation or reading or listening to podcasts or otherwise? Or, or what are you doing during your red light therapy sessions? Uh, well, yeah, usually I uh, like I'm uh, posting on Instagram <laughs> or something. My daily posts is around like around the time that I'm doing the red light. So it's a good uh, you know, opportunity to sit down and use it at that time. Well, it's also pretty smart in the sense that you're, you're countering the blue light from your, from your cell phone or whatever you're using with the red light. So yeah. you're not uh, yeah. affecting your circadian rhythm or your eyes with that blue light as much. And so you also do coaching, correct, Seam? Yeah, yeah. And so with your clients, how often are you recommending red light therapy or like sunlight exposure or whatnot to improve their their health and wellness and, and longevity well it depends on whether or not they're able to do that if they already have it some sort of device or they don't and they're they can get it then uh, yeah i always always recommend it because uh, i think that is one of the few let's say tech gadgets or biohacking gadgets uh, that you know works uh, or is one of the more like immediate ones that you can see more uh, faster results from whereas like different kinds of i don't know brain sensors or something uh, (laughs) 
different kinds of devices, you may not see those uh, effects uh, at all. And uh, with the red light, you most people at least like they feel something and they uh, do notice uh, some uh, improvements. How would I recommend them do it? Uh, well, I would recommend them doing like very similarly to uh, what I do: fifty minutes uh, every day. Uh, just you know, choose the best time that uh, they can do it. Not too close to bedtime. In the morning is fine, and uh, around the noon is fine. Doing it like around exercise has also been found to uh, have like benefits. So before exercise and after exercise improves, let's say muscle mass and strength uh, response, and also after exercise lowers some of the uh, let's say inflammation. And so that kind of beckons the question when you said the red light therapy is one one of the technologies that you most often recommend because because it works. So if someone is sitting on the fence, they're kind of learning about red light therapy. You know, they're reading different blogs or books or, or information online, and they're kind of sitting on the fence, not really sure if they should pull the trigger on investing in a piece of red light therapy technology. What would you tell them to kind of nudge them one way or the other? Well, it would it would be good like if they got to get their first hand experience uh, with something. You know, they uh, either some conference or some uh, clinic, like a biohacking center that has it. Then they should try it first if they are skeptical and you know see uh, what they feel. Of course, it's also good to just read the research. The research is pretty uh, long, or there's a lot of research about it, and yeah, and also the testimonial. Like if there's uh, thousands of people that say it, it works, like I very rarely uh, see people having like negative uh, experiences and negative uh, thoughts about red light therapy, at least like in the biohacking circle, like everyone just loves it. The only people that may be skeptical would be like just let's say, the uh, average uh, fitness person who's uh, skeptical of biohacking. So uh, they would just say like, uh, it's just, you know, nothing really important or it's even if it has benefits, then it's not like a super, let's say the biggest, biggest thing that matters, which yeah, like it doesn't matter for strength and it doesn't matter for uh, hypertrophy that much. Uh, but it may have matter for you know skin health and uh, just the circadian side. So lastly, Seem, I always like to ask people, what are, what are a couple of things that you could suggest to the audience that they could do today, they could implement today to start optimizing their health, uh, wellness, and longevity? Preferably something you haven't mentioned already, although you've covered quite a bit, but if not, just re- reiterating something that uh, you've already spoken about. But what can someone start um, implementing today? Yeah, well, besides all these fundamentals that I already said, Walking is a good thing, and uh, the research also finds that uh, walking for longer is also linked to longevity and reduced mortality. The optimal amount is somewhere like 12,000 to 13,000 steps a day, so somewhere around there is kind of good uh, goal to aim for, and that is where's the lowest the mortality risk. Uh, and uh, like going longer than that, 15,000, 20,000, that doesn't uh, provide additional benefits. But if you're doing only 2,000 steps, then uh, that will be like a, on the opposite side. Like a negative thing so yeah twelve thousand steps is i think a good uh, goal to import and as well the uh, gait speed so if you're walking very slowly that has also been found to be uh, a bad uh, link to uh, like mortality whereas if you're walking faster then uh, maybe may indicate just you know general fitness and uh vitality gotcha i like that answer that's a unique one that's a that's a different one and i would guess um if you could doing it out in nature would be optimal mm. versus doing it in the city but walking it all and getting those steps in is the most important thing i would think yeah, absolutely. Like uh, being in nature, you're doing this uh, nature bathing, bathing and being you know, surrounded by these uh, essential oils as well that you get from the trees. And that's also good for the immune system. So, uh, yeah, you're getting uh, many stones with one, many, many birds with one stone. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Love it. All right, Sim, I appreciate your time, man. Where can people go to learn more about you and learn more from you? Yeah, my uh, website is uh, seamlund.com and uh, I'm also seamlund on uh, YouTube, Instagram and uh, any other platform. Yeah, people. And as you can see in the podcast title, that's with two I's, S-I-I-M. All right, Seam, man, you're full of information. I loved talking with you today. I know the audience learned a lot. Uh, appreciate your time. You know, keep putting out these amazing books and the amazing content so, so we can all keep learning from you. Uh, but again, appreciate your time. Yeah, thanks. All right, guys, for Seamland, this is Dr. Mike Belkowski signing off another episode of the Red Light Report. Everyone have a fabulous week. Thank you for listening to the Red Light Report. If you like what you heard today, go ahead and leave us a review on iTunes and other podcast platforms to help spread the word so other people can learn about the many health, wellness, and longevity benefits of red light therapy. If you're looking for more educational content, check out our Instagram page at biolight.shop in our YouTube channel, BioLite. I'm Dr. Mike Belkowski, and I'll see you on the next episode.